Welcome back to 25 Minute Physiology. In this series, I'll be able to tackle some of your most interesting and exciting physiological topics and do it at a lot more depth than your smaller five minute series. So if you watched one of the five minute videos and those excited you a little bit, but you kind of wanted to know more or hear more detail about what's going on or, or see it in a different light, that's why I made the 25 minute series. In this particular lecture, we're gonna be talking about lactate metabolism. So sit back and enjoy, and let's get started with lactate. Now, it's much easier to interpret some of these things, especially for most of you who I assume actually don't have any background in chemistry, which is okay, it's exactly why I'm making this video. Even those of you that do, I'm sure you're gonna actually maybe learn a few things too about lactate. So it's, it's much easier though to understand these things if you see them in front of you. That's why I'm gonna do this with a screencast, and I made these little animations and little characters and cartoons for you to help you visualize what's actually happening with lactate metabolism. Let's go ahead and jump right into it then. So what we have to understand is lactate is a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. This means it's being generated from the metabolism of glucose. Now glucose or sugar or carbohydrate, which is for the record the same word, right? Those are basically the same thing. If we look at the chemical structure or the name in that for that fact, or for that matter of fact, of carbohydrate, it is carbohydrate. This means it is a carbon molecule that has been hydrated. So it's simply a carbon that has a H2O attached to it. That's why the chemical um, formula for a carbohydrate is C6H12O6. In other words, six carbons and six waters. All right, so glucose, comes in that six carbon chain. If you can see here from our, our cartoon, the one, two, three, four, five, six, those six carbons are, are all on a chain there. Now, when we go through the process of anaerobic glycolysis or simply glycolysis, lysis means to lyse or to break apart, and glyco, of course, referring to glucose. Glycolysis simply means that we split this six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules. Now we call those carbons, or those molecules, pyruvate. Okay, now for those biochemists and, and such out there, a little bit more detail. When, whenever you split atoms from, a, from their bond, right, it takes some energy to split the atom apart, but then it gives off some energy. Now that response, that overall balance can be positive or negative. In other words, the reaction component there can either give off energy or it can be a net requiring of energy. In this particular case, in, the, in, the, in regard to human skeletal muscle physiology, particularly with exercise, this particular reaction is exergonic. In other words, it gives off energy. So it takes a little bit of energy right here. So some, uh, let's just take a look at this bond right here. So the bond between the third and fourth carbon, for example, say that's the carbon we split. We had to put some energy into that system and bang, we pop that molecule into two separate molecules. It does give off some energy though, which is why you see this little molecule over here in the corner called ATP. Okay, ATP is the energy currency for all metabolism, for all of biology, it doesn't matter human or not. Okay, so that's what we're looking to get is this ATP molecule. So we go through glycolysis, it, we invest in a little bit of ATP, but we gain out a little bit more. So our net result is a little bit positive. But your body doesn't work on a little bit positive. It wants big positives. So what we can see here is this is not the big picture. The idea is not to generate pyruvate. Well, it is, but it's not to generate ATP right here. What we wanna do is convert pyruvate into something else which gives us way more ATP. But that requires aerobic metabolism. This starts to begin to help you understand the relationship between anaerobic and aerobic metabolism. For some reason, people think these are opposing, or you have one or the other, or one's bad for the other one. But folks, it's not how aerobic and anaerobic metabolism works. These things are lined up next to each other. One directly helps the other. They're beneficial, they're complementary. So now that we've created this pyruvate, we have to figure out how do we deal with it? Well, what we do with pyruvate depends entirely on one thing. What do our O2 levels look like? If we have sufficient amounts of O2 available, we're gonna take this pyruvate and we're gonna ship it into the mitochondria. Now, anytime you hear mitochondria, this is a special organelle where we make most of the energy in our cells. This is true, again, of animals, other 
humans, non-human, doesn't really matter. Uh, any multicellular organism, in fact, is going to be using mitochondria for oxidative metabolism. Anytime you hear the word oxidation or aerobic, this is the same basic idea that we're having to use oxygen and we're having to do this in the mitochondria. This is our only option for location for aerobic metabolism. So we'll take this pyruvate, we'll ship it into the mitochondria, like you can see here, this red little blobby thing, and then we'll convert our pyruvate into these two little molecules called acetyl or acetyl-CoA. Now, it doesn't matter what these molecules mean, and, and I know I'm getting you deep into some chemistry here, but just hold on tight. You're going to see this big picture now, and it's going to help you understand what lactate really is. So keep following with me here. So we made ourselves to these acetyl-CoA molecules. Now, each one of these molecules is going to get a spin through what some folks will call the citric acid cycle or the TCA. It's kind of a big, fancy system that's going to end up generating some stuff that's going to be sent to what's called the ETC, the electron transport chain. But the point is that eventually is going to generate a bunch of ATP. This is what we're really working for. Now, this image is actually even a bit deceiving because the ATP molecule here should be like 10 times the size of the one here because we generate maybe two, three, four ATP over here, but out here it's going to be something like 40. So it's 10 or 20 times the amount of ATP created here than we created from simply anaerobic glycolysis. So we can think of this again as that the fact that we're not really trying to generate ATP from anaerobic glycolysis. We're really trying to generate pyruvate so that we can generate acetyl-CoA so that we can go through this citric acid cycle. That's really what we're trying to get after. Right? And the reason O2 or oxygen is so important here is because of what's happening with these carbons. So you have to understand this six carbon, three carbon thing. So if we go back to the beginning, Remember, glucose is a six carbon chain. It gets split into two, three carbon molecules. Again, we call those pyruvate. Each one of those pyruvates gets then converted into acetyl CoA, but the acetyl CoAs only have two carbons. So we have to understand what happened to our carbons here because this explains to us everything about what lactate is and why we create it. Your body, and I'm going to violate some biochemistry rules here, don't kill me, but it gets the basic understanding here. Your body's not going to generate or give up a carbon. It's not going to let a, break, a bond break. In general, atoms won't want to break from their molecule unless they have something better to go to. Well, in this particular case, if you have free-floating carbon around in your body, it essentially it's going to function like acid. And your body is not going to put itself in an acidic environment. All of its enzymes and other things don't function in an extra acidic environment. So your body says, look, I know we need to get rid of a carbon so that we can go through the Krebs cycle. But I'm only going to do that if there's something around I know will bond with the carbon. And that happens to be O2, right? So when you start generating a bunch of pyruvate, what do you do? <gasps> right? You start respirating. You're trying to bring in air. Most of what's in air, not most of, but what we're concerned with right now is, that's in air is oxygen. So you take a deep breath, you bring in O2. The O2 then binds with this extra carbon that gives you a little bit of energy to make some high energy intermediates. But the point is, you generate this carbon dioxide. You then go, <sighs> breathe the carbon dioxide out as waste. So O2 was, was brought in. <sighs> It attached to a carbon that was from sugar and CO2 out. O2 in, CO2 out. In fact, if you look closely here at the, the TCA cycle, the Krebs cycle, you see that for every turn of the Krebs cycle, you generate two carbon dioxides. So let's put this whole thing together now. You start with the six carbon glucose. It gets split into two separate three carbon pyruvates. Each pyruvate gets converted into acetyl-CoA, which means you go from two three-carbon molecules to two two-carbon molecules. So we have one carbon dioxide burnt here, and we have one carbon dioxide that would be over here if I put it on the figure. Then this acetyl-CoA gets sent through the Krebs cycle, and each turn burns one two carbon dioxide. And this one would go through, and you would burn one two carbon dioxide. So we start with the six-carbon glucose molecule, and we end with no carbons, 
a bunch of ATP, and some water. Well, this is all fine and dandy if we've got a lot of O2 around. But when you start doing high-intensity exhaustive exercise, you start generating too much pyruvate for the amount of O2 that you have that can handle it. All right, think of it this way. You generate pyruvate, you're going through anaerobic metabolism in the local exercising muscle. So again, you're running up a hill as fast as you can and you start burning and generating lactate in your hamstrings and quads and glutes, right? You have to though, because the sugar is in those muscles, this metabolism is happening in that exercising muscle. But the oxygen that you use comes from the outside world. So I have to <gasps> breathe in oxygen, transport it through my body, get it through my lungs, get it into my bloodstream, transport it into muscle, bring it into muscle, bring it into mitochondria, and then it can take care of this pyruvate. It's simply too slow. Right? I'll be generating way too much pyruvate because I'm going to, I need energy way too fast, which means I have to go anaerobic. So our body has to come up with a separate system that allows us to handle this somehow. Right. Well, stick with me here, but this is what basically happens. You take pyruvate and you start attaching a hydrogen proton to it. Now, hydrogen uh, is a fancy way, again, of saying proton. Those terms are a bit interchangeable here. But here's what you have to understand about hydrogen. When it is free and floating around in the world, it's called acid, right? That's what it means. pH, you've heard the term potential hydrogen, right? So something with a high pH or low pH is acidic or, or basic. Well, it stands for potential hydrogen, which means a bunch of free hydrogen means a bunch of acid. So here's what your body says. You're generating a bunch of acid, generating a bunch of hydrogen. We can't get oxygen in fast enough to go through aerobic metabolism. So we will start attaching these hydrogen ions to pyruvate. When we do that, we have a special name for this molecule. We no longer call it pyruvate, we now call it lactate. That's what lactate is, folks. Is it simply a pyruvate that's holding onto the hydrogen for you? So now, think of it this way. Is lactate causing fatigue? Right, this is our question. Is lactate causing you to be tired? Is that its fault? Do I need to get in the gym the next day after a hard workout because I'm sore so I can work the lactic acid out? Well, not only is that not true, but lactate's not causing you to be fatigued in the first place. In fact, it's doing what we call acting as a buffer. It is stopping you from becoming acidic because it is holding on to what would otherwise be free acid. So it is stopping you from becoming so acidic. Another thing it does is it acts like a fuel. Remember, lactate is basically a, a already pre-digested or pre-broken down sugar molecule. All I have to do is get rid of this pesky little hydrogen without just dumping it into the system because then it would be acidic in the area again. But if I can find some way to handle hydrogen I have just converted myself back into pyruvate, which is an excellent fuel source. I mean, once it's in pyruvate, if we can ship it to mitochondria, we're off and running through the Krebs cycle and we generated a bunch of ATP. So if we can come up with a way to get that hydrogen off of it, we're gonna have a very, very potent fuel source. So how do we handle this hydrogen so that we can get lactate into its fuel form? Well, the answer is, <gasps> there we go again with that damn oxygen. It turns out not only does oxygen play very well with carbon, but it plays very well with hydrogen. In fact, if I bring in a couple of hydrogens and stick it on a, an oxygen molecule, I get myself some H2O, in other words, water. Right? Now, again, this isn't perfect chemistry, but this is effectively showing you what's happening. Once I start generating a bunch of lactate, I start increasing my respiration, right? Because <gasps> I'm trying to bring in oxygen so I can handle some of that hydrogen, turn it into water, H2O, freeing up lactate, letting it be back into pyruvate. Now we can do this in a bunch of different ways. If I can't do it directly in the cell itself, I'll have to come up with some other means. 
I'll talk about more of this in just a second. The third thing or the third important aspect of lactate to keep in mind, number one, being a buffer, number two, being a fuel, is, is that it acts like a hormone. In fact, you can take a look at Dr. George Brooks from Cal Berkeley. He's done a lot of this work, been, work, been focusing on research, uh, his research on lactate for probably the last 30 or more years. But he sort of coined the term lactohormone. Um, he's recognized the fact that lactate is an important signaling molecule. It will communicate with the cell. It will communicate with other tissue throughout the body. It goes in the bloodstream. That's what a hormone is, is something that communicates with other tissue. So it's very, very important in that. Perhaps we'll do a separate video showing you um, the importance of it as a hormone. But for now, I actually want to talk a little bit more about the fuel. So let's go back to point number two. You can actually read George's stuff if you want more on the lactose stuff. He did a podcast I know pretty recently with Dr. Rhonda Patrick on her platform, the Found My Fitness stuff, where they talked a little bit about this stuff, but I don't think they certainly didn't do it at this beginner level, uh, and they weren't as um, focused on this topic. They were talking about a bunch of other things. So you can check out more of that stuff there or read a bunch of his papers. I know he's given tons of presentations over the years. Um, he pretty much gives it all away for free too, so I'm sure he's got stuff up on YouTube and websites and things like that. So you can check out more about that. But let's talk about using that lactate as a fuel. So one of the things we can do with it is ship it to non-exercising muscle fibers. Now these can be fibers directly in the actual exercising muscle or in a separate muscle entirely. What I mean is this. So say for example my hamstring is, is burning, it's on fire, and I'm generating a bunch of lactate in my hamstring. Well, we're not actually using all of the muscle fibers in my hamstring. All right, there's a thing called the size principle, but not all of your fibers are activated at the same time, and they're certainly not all activated unless you're at absolute maximal force production, which is probably not happening. And so there are some fibers, and they're probably um, the anaerobic or the, the aerobic, the slow twitch, the oxidative fibers, that even if they are active, they've got more capillaries, they've got a lot more mitochondria, they're much more aerobically fit, so they will handle the lactate, All right? They're gonna say, hey, look, you've got a bunch of basically pre-digested carbohydrate floating around. We can take it because we have a lot of free mitochondria. We're not bound up, we're not behind like you guys are. Bring it into us, we've got a lot of free oxygen. We'll take the oxygen, we'll bind it to the hydrogen, make water, and then we'll just have ourselves a nice little free sugar party. The analogy I'll give you is this. All right, uh, if you're a college student, this works. That's why I use it with my college students all the time. If you're not, you can probably relate to a time in your life when maybe finances weren't so great. That time in your life when basically if it was free, you were going to take it no matter what. All right, so imagine I walk into my class and I've got a cake. And then just imagine it's your favorite type of cake ever, double chocolate, ice cream, whatever your favorite is. And I say, hey, look, here you go. Here's this cake. I'll give it to you entirely free with one catch. Uh, I didn't really keep it in the fridge long enough, and there's a little bit of mold in the corner. Well, if you're a college student, you would probably say, hey, you know what the hell with it? I'm taking that cake. I'll just cut the moldy part off, throw that away, and I got free sugar. All right? Where some people, you know, maybe if you're not in the college lifestyle anymore, you're like, oh, if it's got mold on any part, I'm just throwing it away. Well, your body's kind of like that college kid that says, look, you see lactate, you see garbage. I see free pyruvate with a little bit of garbage in the corner. I'll just cut that off really quick, dump that into water, and move on as pyruvate. I'll take that pyruvate, I'll run it right back into the, my free mitochondria, we'll go through aerobic metabolism, and we will, we will be cooking with a ton of free ATP. If we don't ship it to another muscle fiber or another muscle entirely, right? So if we generate in the hamstring, we might ship it to the shoulder, the fingertips or the toes or the neck or somewhere else. We can also ship it to a different muscle called our heart. Right? Well, again, we've known a lot of this stuff for a long time. I'm not, I still don't know why it hasn't gained the mainstream public attention. But this is not new information I'm presenting to you. Right? But the heart is what some folks call the ultimate slow twitch fiber. It's extremely oxidative, even more slow twitch than your uh, skeletal muscle slow twitch fibers. So it can handle lactate no problem. Right? It's got plenty of oxygen available to cut it off, make it back into sugar, and get itself some free ATP. Another very well-known place to handle lactate is the liver. So this is a process called gluconeogenesis. Gluco meaning new. 
or glucose, sorry, neo meaning new, and genesis meaning formation or creation. So this gluconeogenesis refers to the creation of glucose from a non-glucose initial source. In this case, we'll take lactate and specifically two lactate molecules, because remember, lactate is three carbons. We'll take two lactates, smash it together, and make a new glucose molecule. And then we'll store that glucose probably as glycogen until we need it, and we can put it into the blood as glucose. And the liver has a bunch of reasons why it needs to do that to one of its main properties, um, and in terms of this context of the liver anyways, is to maintain blood sugar levels. So blood sugar gets low, it can kick a little bit of this into the bloodstream and bring blood sugar levels back up. Okay. The fourth and probably most exciting is the brain. Now, most folks don't realize this, and this is where it gets really exciting. I think this is what generated a lot of the interest when I put this up on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Was For years, we've been teaching undergraduates and graduates and even doctoral students that your brain can only use glucose as a fuel source. You've got this thing called the blood-brain barrier and stuff can't cross it. But sugar can, so it only uses sugar. Well, it turns out your brain, um, and for that matter, matter, red blood cells, your neurons, these things are all generating the lactate. They're all pretty much func uh, functioning only anaerobically. They're all using glucose um, as their main fuel source. But as a result of that, when you, you, when you make or use glucose as a fuel, you make lactate. So yeah, that's right. Your red blood cells actually produce lactate. You're making lactate right now as you're watching this video and, and taking notes and everything. All right, so back to the point of, of our brain. So we've got our brain that, that primarily uses glucose as a fuel, but of course we've known for a long time too, again, decades, that things like ketone bodies and uh, stuff like that can be used as well. But now that you understand that, hey, lactate is actually just a predigested or, or half broken down molecule of glucose, of course we can use lactate as a fuel source in our brain as well. That's right, I'll say that one more time. Your brain loves lactate as a fuel. Right? So in fact, uh, going back to Dr. Brooks's work, if I took you right now and I sat you on an exercising bike and I give you an IV in your right arm and I, in that IV I give you a nonstop supply of glucose and in your left arm I give you an IV with a nonstop supply of lactate, your body would take the lactate. Because it's, again, we don't have to invest any energy. Remember back all the way at the beginning, we talked about, hey, when I break down glucose into pyruvate, I do get some energy, but it does cost me some energy in the system. Well, lactate has the same energy output, but none of the energy requirement to make. And so my net balance is much higher. In other words, it's much more energetically favorable. Okay, so your brain is going to sense that and say, hey, look, if lactate's coming in at the same time glucose is coming in, I'm going to pick lactate because I'll, I'll just handle it with oxygen, so assuming I am oxygenated enough. This realization that lactate is critical to brain, the brain metabolism is really, really important for healthy and, and even injured folks. Uh, I'm not going to go too much down the treatment of lact using lactate as treatment for traumatic brain injury and things like that. But if we think about it from the, the healthy perspective, right, we've known for years that, that someone who exercises, especially if someone does high intensity exercise, they have improved memory. It can help with treatment of depression. Um, if, you, if you exercise during finals week, you score better on your exams. It helps you remember things when you study. But no one's ever really put the connection or, or connected the dots of why that is. Now, certainly it's multifaceted, but one of the things that's probably contributing to it is the fact that you are literally fueling your brain better. People talk about, about uh, you know, carbohydrate loading for your muscles and replenishing muscle glycogen and making sure that's topped off, but we forget you need fuel here as well. Your, the neurons, the astrocytes up there actually need to produce metabolism as well. It can't just take sugar and make ATP. It's the same things going on there that you learn in skeletal muscle. So if I can get all this energy to your system, to your brain, and it has this massive bump of sugar in a pre-digested or, or pre-metabolized, I should say, fashion, function goes up. All right, so I think that's some of the, the more exciting aspects of lactate. Hopefully this video helped you learn a little bit. Hopefully the animations that I created there that took me like 100 hours to create 
helps you visualize it a little bit better. I'm excited, looking forward to the future of lactate metabolism. Uh, hopefully soon I'll have to come back and add some more things to this or maybe I'll just do a second part. But well, I need some help from you though. Uh, hopefully I, I want to continue doing things like this. I think it's fun, it's important, it's information people like. So a couple of favors from you. Get at me on my social media, uh, Twitter and Instagram, at Dr. Andy Galpin right here. And let me know any questions you have about this. Let's continue the dialogue, folks, and let's help people learn and educate. And most importantly, let's inspire people to be smarter and spend more time with education. So questions you have up there. I also want a second thing from you, and that is, what do you want to see next? So let me know. Uh, and I want to cover a bunch of different topics. Um, nutrition, exercise, ex -phys, movements, coaching, all these things. So what are you most excited about learning next? What can I do for you? Um, you can check me out here. You can also check out this stuff on my new website, andygalpin.com. It'll be available up there. Feel free to share this thing around. Pass it on out. Uh, let's get this in, in, in front of the eyes of as many people as possible so we can start educating everyone on what lactate really is um, and the importance of exercise and overall health and function. So thanks for now, and we'll see you next time.